Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General coming to you with another episode in our series on the Bretonian dukedoms. Today, we are going to be focusing on the dukedom of Artois in Bretonia, located in the center of the northern part of the kingdom. Looking at the history of Artois, it shares much of the history as the other Bretonian dukedoms, and it really kind of kicks off with a group of humans moving across the mountains from the east to establish established land of Bretonia using many of the ruined cities that the elves left behind after their War of the Dwarves to establish their first settlements, which in many cases grew up to the castles and cities of Bretonia as we know them today. In the case of Artois, we can kind of fast forward to the year 977 of the imperial calendar. Now, all the individual parts of Bretonia that we now know of dukedoms existed at that time as almost separate kingdoms or separate nations at the very least. And Artois was no exception to this, existing in its own right, protecting its own borders. In this year of 977, so a thousand years after the arrival of Sigmar in the Empire, the whole of Bretonia was awash in chaos. Beastmen, Norsken raiders, greenskins were ravaging the land, and the whole place was being torn apart. It looked like it was the end of humanity in this part of the old world. And then Gilles de Breton rose to prominence and started to pull together an army that began to fight back this tide of evil. And eventually he got to the Siege of Moussillon, where there was a huge army of undead and beastmen besieging the city, and Gilles' army rode in, there was a huge battle, and this is where the army connected with the leader of Artois at the time, which was a chap by the name of Folgar de Artois, and uh, he uh, joined up with them, and in the midst of this battle, towards the end of it, as the beastmen broke ranks and the knights pursued into the forest, he got separated from the group, and this is where he saw the Lady of the Lake, he was given a drink from the Grail and became the ninth Grail companion and the ninth ever Grail Knight. Now, for those of you who perhaps don't know Bretonia that well, when you drink from the cup that the lady presents to you as a knight, you become basically a super-powered human being. Uh, you become extra strong, you live a particularly long time, and it has a lot of benefits for you. And so he became the ninth of these great warriors to join the army, and together they rode on, liberating the whole of Bretonia from its threats, and then finally freeing Caron, the north of Bretonia, allowing peace to thrive once more in their individual nations. At this point, with Gilles Le Breton having led all of these different territories to victory, they all got together in the province of Artois itself. Now, the idea was to formalize their arrangement to make an alliance to form a single kingdom with Gilles Le Breton at the head and as the first king of Bretonia. Now, in order to honor this momentous occasion, Falgar went out into the forests of Artois and slayed a legendary boar by the name of Morfnock. I think it's the way you say it. Now, we presume that this is an albino boar, for it was from the head of this mighty beast that Artois took its sigil. And thus, the albino boar against the burgundy background, or red background, is the symbol of Artois to this day. Now, in this video, we didn't really cover the whole campaign of Gilles Le Breton, but if you are interested in the Unification War of Bretonia, do check out my Green Knight video popping up in the top right-hand corner now, because after he died, he was resurrected as this ghostly figure in Bretonian folklore known as the Green Knight. So do check that out. As for the dukedom itself, it's split into two main areas. The first is what takes up most of the dukedom, and that is the Forest of the Ardennes. A truly horrendous place filled with horrors. Monsters, dragons, beastmen. It tends to attract a lot of questing knights who are going there to earn their reputation, to maybe make themselves worthy in the eye of the lady so that they can get her blessing and become grail knights. But a lot of knights have fallen in these forests. The idea of fallen swords and armored helms being seen growing through trees because they've been left there by dead knights for over such 
such a long period of time that the trees have grown around these dropped items is not uncommon in these forests and even things as innocuous as the legendary boars of the forest that are often hunted have become tainted with a bit of chaos and have become known themselves as artois boars but they have become exclusively carnivorous loving to feast on men and enjoying it particularly when they scream now peasants around the area have been said to say much like the stories about when a bear attacks you curl up into a ball if you're being chomped on by an artois boar don't make any noise it will soon lose interest and wander off however if you scream with pain or trying to scare it it just gets it more excited and it will chomp down on you all the harder and eat you alive all the quicker but you know what, peasants in Bretonnia are stupid things, so why would we listen to them anyway? That is the forest of Larden, a very horrendous and scary place to live. However, there are human settlements within these environments. There are small villages, all of which are surrounded by tall walls. There is no area of safety, and if you didn't have walls up, you'd be in a lot of trouble. So they're all pretty heavily defended for small villages. Now, a lot of these villages are so isolated by the dangers of traveling in these woods that a villager can perhaps go their entire life without seeing an outsider at all. That's how isolated they are in this thick and dangerous forest. In fact, leaving and traveling around is considered a kind of suicide amongst the population of the Arden Forest. They will have an actual funeral for you if you leave the village to go to another village or to travel somewhere else, particularly amongst the peasants. Maybe not so much about the nobility, they believe that the nobility will be well enough protected to get from one place to another, but if you're just a lonely peasant traveler, they just think you're dead. So they just go on, they have your funeral, they assume you're dead, and if you come back, they treat you as though you were some kind of undead creature. They just don't believe that you've come back or survived through any natural means, and they sort of have this understanding that if you survived and came back, some kind of witchcraft is at play, or you've turned to the taint of chaos or something horrific is going on with you so there's not exactly a warm welcome upon anyone's return to their villages within this horrible place however there is some commerce that goes on so we have to assume that there are some traveling well-protected merchants in the area dealing in lumber dealing in charcoal burners these tend to be the main sources of income for the people living in the region of the Arden. One has to think most of this is probably coming from the outer edges rather than right in the depths of the forest itself. In terms of how they live, they can't grow crops. They mainly rely on animal husbandry here to sort of bring up pet pigs and cows and stuff and let them wander the forest fairly guarded because, as we have said, there are bears, wolves, and beastmen and all sorts of stuff out there. So they won't wander too far away from the village, but that's how they maintain their food supplies within this region. As I said, this is mostly isolated villages in the Arden, and the nobility with protection and arms can move around the forest. And so most of the nobles within the forest of Artois tend to run maybe two or three of these villages and it's a bit hard to hang on to and they do continuously try to expand but new villages tend to last sort of less than a year most times through some kind of attack from some beast creature or monstrosity so it's hard to establish new fiefdoms although there is kind of an open policy in the dukedom that you can go into the forest and establish new villages of your own to expand your own power so chaos is a ladder, as some might say. Now, the most established noble in the forest of Arden is a chap by the name of Baron Cholodiger, who is a grail knight, a fantastic warrior, and he's managed to amass as many as three settlements, which is considered fairly successful in the area itself. He's built a grail chapel in each of these, a very dedicated knight he is to fall back upon, and most of these smaller villages will have either the keep or the Grail Chapel made of stone, so they have a place to make a last stand if there is ever an attack and their wooden stockades are breached. Now, the other region that Artois is split into is to the western side, where there is this patch of clear land, mostly used for crop farming. A lot of the richest parts of Artois are contained in this area. Wealthy, rich, they do trading with the other dukedoms. It's a lot more of a nicer place to live than with within the forest itself. Now, the people of this part of Artois kind of have a bit of a disdain stroke 
look down upon the people who live in the forest. They don't really necessarily consider themselves like a typical person from Artois. They see themselves more as like their cousins from Lyonnais or Longri, rather than really necessarily relating to most of the population that lives within their own dukedom, the forest dwellers, if you will. People in this region, under obviously the protection and banner of the duke, are for the most part ruled by one noble known as Earl Lorset. Now, he's a bit of a funny one. It's thought that he spent his errantry night days wandering the land as a minstrel rather than being particularly knightly. But he is thought to be a kind man, a shrewd politician, and so has wrangled his way into a position of power within this area of the dukedom. Now, when we look at some of the more significant places within these areas of Artois, the first one we will start with is the capital itself, Castle Artois. Now, the castle is set in the middle of the Arden Forest. It's thought to be the only ducal seat with no town around it. So it's just literally the castle out there by itself, really because to establish a town is just dangerous in the Arden and would just be an invitation for somebody to attack it. So a town has never been established near the castle of Artois. As far as its fortifications, it has its high walls. It also has a ditch with many sharpened stakes around its side. Its courtyard is designed to accommodate many warriors for when they are harboring or when a lot of the population has to flee to the castle in case of a beastman war herd or what have you going through the area. It's also said that the great hall of the castle, who um, the dukes have all come from a long line of hunters ever since that first duke who killed the magnificent albino boar, and the whole hall is covered with heads of trophy caught animals or monsters and pelts from the great victories fought against these beasts of the forest. All in all, a fairly heavily fortified castle, but not with a lot of sort of commerce or trade coming out of it. Really just a seat of power where the armies of Artois can ride out to march and meet any threat. As for the armies themselves of Artois, they're said to consist a lot of light cavalry. The favoured strategy, it seems, of Artois is quick strikes, managing to hunt war herds down on the go, really hunt any vicious creatures, not a lot of heavy burden. So rather than sort of men-at-arms or even necessarily bowmen, you're more likely to see yeomen mounted with lances uh, just chasing stuff down through the forest, making themselves useful to the duke. Because there's not a lot of, there's not a big town, there's not a lot of trade, uh, there's not a lot of farmers around the area, so the lot of the supplies for the castle all have to be shipped in. As such, there's often sort of a lot of protected caravans of traders coming in and out of Castle Artois, just to keep the place stocked. Now, you would have to assume they have a good stockpile come any siege, but they would not be able to be self-sustaining, really, in any way, shape, or form, were they to be isolated for a prolonged amount of time. Moving on from the castle, we're going to look at the town of Lorette. Looking around the place, you might think it's one of the rare places in the Warhammer world that is not grim dark. Nice town, cobbled streets, clean, a kind of sewage system so it's not all stinking to hell. Really a wonderful place to be. Even though it's on the edges of the forest, you know, it's not too dangerous. A lot of entertainers and scholars are welcome to the place. It's a place of culture. Of course, it does have its walls because you couldn't exist anywhere near the forest without any walls, but on the whole, a really pleasant place to be. However, it really comes into a bit of weirdness when you look at the punishment system of the whole town. It's very much a meritocracy, it seems, in the town. If you're lazy or dumb or stupid or aren't much used to the town, there's really one punishment for you, and that is exile. And exile means you are not allowed to be within three hours' travels of the wall come sundown on any given day for pain of death. So you're just sent out, never come back, you're a useless or you're an idiot or you're lazy just get the hell out of here you can't live in this town anymore which for many you know being cast out can mean death in this dangerous area you might think oh, okay that's all right to a certain degree but then that expands a little bit as well to you know sometimes when no one's lazy and everyone's contributing but people maybe have too many kids population gets a little bit too high they're not going to expand the wall so they just get rid of some
some people. And then, you know, when someone's maybe just become poor, they might be hardworking, they just don't have much money. Oh, maybe they're out as well. And so the whole policy of the town gets a bit out of hand, and a lot of people end up getting exiled, some to their deaths inevitably in the forests of the Ardennes. A nice place to live if you're in the ups, really. I suppose to a certain degree one could make that argument if anywhere, but here perhaps it's more poignant than anywhere else in the dukedom. Another place we are going to look at is more of a myth or rumour to any civilised circles of society. Now, for many centuries, there has been tales told amongst the peasants and nobles alike of Artois of a secret beastman city within the forest. Now, this it seems unlikely. Beastmen are more nomads, they travel in their war herds, they don't really build cities or towns or anything, so, yeah, you know, people have written this off as a fallacy. But, as with all things and myths and legends, it may be started with a seed of truth. And that is the idea that in one of these little villages of the Ardennes, a Skaven plot was starting to emerge. The Skaven had poisoned one of the wells of the village by the name of Usen. This poisoning did not cause death as many of the Skaven tricks often do, but instead caused the population of the town to begin to mutate and shift and change. Now, rather than giving themselves over to the chaotic powers now that they had become mutants or running off and joining a beastman horde, or what a lot of the mutants do in other areas of the Warhammer world, they banded together and they would not let the mutations change them or wean them away from civilized living. And so, this band of mutant villagers stood against an inevitable Skaven invasion that followed and fought them off. They have ever since still been living in their ancient town, increasing the isolation, not trading with any more towns, and because villages are lost all the time, any of their neighbours or close-by villages will have simply thought that Usen simply fell off the map and was abandoned, like many of the other villages within the Ardennes have been over the centuries. But they still live there, just a village of mutants going about their daily business, knowing that if they were ever probably discovered or truly anyone challenged the existence of this village within the dukedom, they would probably all be put to the sword. But they're just trying to get on with their daily lives. And so there is indeed a city, or more accurately, a village of mutants within the forest of the Ardennes in the old village of Usen. Moving on from the particular places of the Artois dukedom, let's have a look at some of its more notable characters. One that's a bit of an old story, but I just thought was relatively entertaining, just because it gives a glimpse into the way that Games Workshop used to go about naming these things. It was really just a bit of a big gag for a lot of the boys behind the Games Workshop stuff. They didn't take themselves as seriously as perhaps they do these days, whether you like that or not. This is a character by the name of Jean-Luc Brandywine. Now, Jean-Luc Brandywine is the heir of a very long line of famous winemakers who have lived in Artois and have made the finest wine within the dukedom. Long held in favour of the duke's family, they've really prospered. But of late, Jean-Luc's father was murdered recently by obviously a member of a family that is jealous trying to do away with the brandy wines. So he has set himself on a crusade of revenge against them to try and uncover the mystery of the murder of his father with the help of his trusty hound Merlot and his reliable Warhorse Sauvignon. So Sauvignon, Merlot, and Brandywine are off on this mystery to solve who murdered Jean-Luc's father, and so you see the silly naming conventions that Games Workshop used to use. Another character carrying on the proud hunting tradition, and was once a character in 5th edition, I believe it was, of Bretonnia, and that is Reynard Le Chasseur. Reynard Le Chasseur with Groff and Griff? Now, Reynard doesn't really have a model, so I could, couldn't really find many images for him either. So the one on the right is a kind of a conversion that does him probably the most justice, but they hadn't painted it, I couldn't find the painted version of it. And the one on the left is just a knight with two dogs, which is probably how you'd usually see him represented on the tabletop. Now, Reynard essentially is a hunter extraordinaire. Rather than taking in a lance to battle, he prefers to take a, a boar spear. Now, this isn't a throwing spear. 
But essentially it's a very broad, it's much broader than the lance head, the spear, and it has a crossbar. So the idea behind the spear and the hunting spear is that he stabs someone and they can't really get away, but he can keep them at bay because it's got a cross guard. So with his hunting spear, essentially he'd be able to rob any enemies of attacks. So the amount, so say he was fighting a, a big beast with say five attacks, he would stab them with the hunting spear and if he got a wound, he'd roll a dice and the amount that that dice came to was the amount of attacks he took off the enemy. So the idea is that he essentially renders an enemy useless while he's attacking them with a the thing. So either you could go two ways of it. You could give him anti-large and a, a melee attack debuff. You could either go either one of those two routes or both of them. Now the other elements with Renard would be his two dogs, Groff and Griff, and they have described as being the most savage and most loyal of hunting hounds in the old world. And they ride around with him. If you do make these guys, they'd be essentially a free man unit. Or what we haven't seen in Total War Warhammer that we used to see in Total War Rome and the like is the idea of unleashing the dogs and then they're kind of uncontrollable for the rest of the battle and you just sort of get new dogs afterwards. That might be a possibility with Reynard, just have him unleash the dogs rather than them fighting next to him. Or unleash a unit of dogs rather than necessarily just uh, Groff and Griff. He also goes around with his famed hunting eagle, which is his buddy, just rests on his shoulder or his wrist as he charges along with his spear. And that's really about it for Reynard. Essentially, he's just a hunter extraordinaire with the use of his hawk, his two dogs, and his hunting spear, he is an expert hunter of beast and man alike. Probably the best hunter in Bretonia at this time. And so uh, he's made a bit of a name for himself and uh, is an important chap as he wanders across the countryside of Artois. And last but by no means least is the Duke himself. Duke Chilfoy of Artois. Now, he's said to be a relatively stern man, not prone to smiling or humor, and is said, in fact, to only smile when he sees the devastation of his enemies. He, of course, is a, thought to be a good and able hunter, as many of even the men in Artois are considered to be, given that that's where they get much of their food stuff from just hunting the savage forest. And he also carries on this hunting to extend to the beastmen. Much of his time is just spent rampaging around the forest with his armies, slaughtering beast herds before they can conglomerate and become an even bigger threat. So truly a master at hunting and killing beastmen, perhaps coming only second to the Duke of Midland itself, Boris Todbringer, in terms of his hatred for the beastmen. He's also said to be a very strong warrior, the strongest and toughest of all the other nobles within the Dukedom of Artois. That seems not something like flattery, but actual true fact. He is a tried and tested warrior. And because of this, he's thought to be a kind of great war leader, but very simplistic tactics. He's not a strategical genius or anything like that, but he will lead his men into battle successfully. But, you know, tried and true methods as opposed to anything innovative or necessarily new. He's also said to be very uh, sort of unaccustomed or takes a huge dislike to the goings-on at the royal court. He doesn't get involved in the political games as much. He rarely deals with any of his neighboring dukes, and he doesn't really turn up to the royal court. He will obey the orders of the king, but isn't gonna turn up there just to play political games to try and gain any favor. He's too busy trying to control his own province. Now, obviously, the Duke is the final word in justice in his own dukedom when it comes to disputes between nobles in particular. Now, even in this aspect, he's very much kind of a traditionalist and one could argue stubbornly unreasonable. One could even go as far as describing him as pig-headed. See how they went for it in the lore on the sigil? Maybe not the most famously pig-headed and stubborn knight of all knights who once took a sigil, with one famous example in popular culture, but still a pretty pig-headed man. When two grievances are brought before him, he'll usually just rule on the part of the higher rank noble without really taking any of the facts into consideration and the punishments he doles out are brutal. Now this really results in a lot of nobles not taking their grievances to the Duke because what he'll do is very predictable and the Duke kind of likes it this way so he's not hassled with any of the minutiae of what's going on with squabbles between his 
lesser nobles. But overall, the Duke is an able leader to a certain degree, a very stern man, and one who's very much concerned of the protection of his dukedom, and spends most of his time at war fighting the incessant threat that comes from within his own lands. So that is how Duke Chilfroy spends most of his time, and that really is about it for the Dukedom of Artois, ladies and gentlemen. As always, I uh, hope you enjoyed that video. Please do check out the rest of the series if you haven't already, and I hope to catch you all on the next one. Alright guys, bye.